Chapter Six of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixth Reel. Hollywood, August eighteenth. Dear Clara Bell, none of these other moving picture actorines has got anything on me now. I got a personal press agent. It happened in the strangest way. I had have been noticing a tall, handsome gent that dines in my favorite cafeteria about the same time I do, and the way he looked at me with languishing eyes. And the other day we met quite informally. I had my tray laden down with forty-nine cents worth of food, and was using both hands to restrain it. And it was while I was trying to get some lump sugar out of the bowl with my teeth for my java that he sprung to my assistance. One word led to another. You know how it is in society. And before long we were sitting at the same table. I told him how the jealousy of the other moving picture stars was a keeping me down, and he said, "Well, you ought to have a press agent. That's all." I told him I belonged to a pressing club in Grundy Center. But I couldn't use one now, as I was wearing wash dresses and doing them myself in the bathroom. That is when the landlady don't catch me. He laughed. I don't know why, because wash dresses is certainly sensible this time of year. And then he said that is not the kind I mean. I mean a man to put pieces and pictures in the papers and make you notorious like all these other stars. He then told me he was a journalist and had taken such an interest in my art that he would do it for nothing. He said to me. Girly, he says, I'm going to give you a big write-up in the next issue of my magazine, a whole paragraph. I was that overjoyed. He is editor of the Beekeepers Annual, and the next issue is out next Fourth of July, and I can't hardly wait. Just think of seeing my name in print. Won't Grundy Center be proud of my notoriety? And right on top of that good fortune, I nearly lost my life. Never did I face death so close before since the time I moved in a still for George Melford out to Lasky's. On my way out to Inchville. I stepped into a rut and sunk out of sight in the dust. If some cowpuncher had not have thrown me a rope, you would have wept when you got my letter because I wouldn't have wrote it. Inchville is a nice place for any explorer to go after. You take a train to Santa Monica, a streetcar to the end of the line down by the Jap Fishingburg, and they are wait for a bus. There are those that has made it all the same day. Inchville is named after Mr. Thomas Inch, the big boss there. I was told that Mr. Inch's press agent, Mr. O'Hara, named it that to get a raise. But one cannot believe all the idle gossip they hear. Anyway, it has the ocean on one side and is pasted against cliff on the other. You can fall off the top of the highest stage right into the raging surf. Some do. Now I know how those poor people in the Alps must suffer. You are either climbing upstairs or down all the time. The six stages seem right one on top of the other. They tell me that the man who laid it out was jealous of Seattle. When I first arrived, I thought from sounds they took animal pictures. For someone was trying to tease a lion, but one of the girls said no. It was only Scott Sidney taking a death scene, so I went in without fear. I guess I told you how they wanted me to double for Daniel in the lion's den at Seelig's, didn't I? Since that moment, I fought shy of beasts. They were so busy getting ready for Bill Burke, some Irish actress. They tell me she has some piece she is going to do when she gets there about the liquor traffic. It's a Scotch piece, and I can't drink the vile stuff. While I was standing there, Mr. W. S. Hart drove up on top of a horse. My, he does look handsome in his cowboy uniform. Well, no, I would say more dashing than handsome. My, but women are deceitful. I saw Bessie Barris Kale, one of the stars, coming out of her dressing room to start a climb to work, and she was a blonde. You remember in the Rose of the Ranch House she was a perfect brunette. I saw Rhea Mitchell. She is hired to play ingenue leads, but to my mind she wasn't a bit girlish. She didn't slap anybody with her fan or chew the end of her handkerchief like I would have done if had it been her. I went right out and hunted up Mr. Inch. He was on one of the topmost stages, looking at a scene with one eye shut. I heard a girl say that he had his camera eye on a scene. It wasn't so at all. I guess I should know because I have looked into enough of them. Of course, it may have been just a glass eye, but what would he have shut the good one for? I am not like other girls. They can't put those silly things over on me. Well, I busted right in and said, "Mr. Inch, I will accept a position as your ingenue." He looked at me a moment. And said, "You are not constructed right. Ingenues have to have skinny legs and long lashes to be ingenues. And while goodness knows you are skinny enough, something must have etched your eyelashes off while you slept. The first thing you want to do is grow a new crop of eyelashes. What's the next thing?" I asked. "See some other director," he says. I thanked the poor simp and laughed. "What can he know of the emulsions that lurk in a woman's soul by looking at her eyelashes?" I got a chance of a fine engagement week after next that I may accept. If someone don't get there ahead of me, so must close now and get dinner. I am dining in my room now that the landlady has a cold and can't smell nothing. Love, Molly.
August 25th. Dear Clara Bell, What do you know about this Anita King getting selected for an auto ride, all by herself, from here to New York? I seen her in a picture out to Lasky's, and she don't look to me like she could drive old Henry's depot hack, much less an automobile. I asked one of the boys down to Inchville about it. I said, why do they select Miss King to go across, when I have so much spare time? He says, because she has so much nerve and personality. I says, well, I got them. And he says, kid, you sure have. If you was a French girl, your nerve would take you right to Berlin. But your personality wouldn't give you a jitney ride to Ocean Park. And Ocean Park is one mile away. I says, I don't want to go to Ocean Park. I want to go to New York. He says, what's the matter with loss? Meaning Los Angeles. And I answers, nothing. But I want to go in an open automobile to New York and get my features in print and become notorious in everything. He says, they've let you stay here this long without being arrested. So don't take no chances by moving. Oh, the landlady just sent word I am wanted on the phone. Maybe at last the managers have come to their senses. We'll close. Love, Molly. End of chapter 6